But every now and then in history, history produces a man who can take all these elements that individually don't mean much, realize the strengths in the people that make up the company, and he can put these all together in a magical way and make something worthwhile. He can make history. And in 1954, history produced just such a man, a person of such personal moral courage that he was able to talk to everybody in these two separate companies that were just getting together and get everybody into the ship rowing in the same direction and heading for glory. That man is here with us today, George Romney. Please welcome him. And he it might not like this, but it is his birthday. So let's sing him happy birthday. <laughs> yesterday. Yesterday yesterday was his birthday. Yesterday. So let's sing him happy birthday. Uh, happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, dear George. Happy birthday. How many of you are Rambler owners? <laughs> All right. How many of you are, were Rambler dealers? Well, there are quite a few dealers here. Well, in any event, uh, as I've thought about this occasion and what you did for me, uh, I've thought about uh, the story of the man who went into the uh, shopping mall and uh, with his little daughter, and his little daughter had to go to the bathroom. And he couldn't take her into the men's bathroom, so he stopped a woman in the hall and uh, asked her and uh, asked her to help him out and so she took his daughter into the bathroom and uh, when he she brought him out her out uh, he was thanking her very profusely when his daughter spoke up oh daddy you don't have to thank her she had to go too <laughs> so so i had to go too see <laughs> and we all had to go uh, but I wouldn't be able to do, to do what I'm doing now or wouldn't have been able to do what I did after I left uh, American Motors if it hadn't been for what you did, uh, both as dealers and also as those who bought Ramblers. And let me orient you a little bit uh, about uh, 1954, about the time uh, I was res became responsible for the future of the organization. I had a young son who was about seven, eight years of age at the time, and we were doing 2% of the industry at that time. And uh, when I came home one night, he said, Dad, we make the best cars, don't we? Well, I said, of course we make the best cars. Well, he said, why do less than 2% of the country, people in the country agree with us? <laughs> and I said, well, size doesn't always indicate strength, and popularity doesn't always indicate truth. And sales volume doesn't always indicate value. And that's a fact. Now, how many of you have read Patrick Foster's book? Well, if you haven't got a cop copy, you ought to get a copy. Because that's a great account uh, of that company and how, what it brought it into being and uh, what it was able to do in a very brief period of time. And then how the future that we had built up because we were on a roll. We moved from 2% of the industry to 8% of the industry in eight years. And we forced the big three uh, into compact car production. And the press, press used to laugh at me when I'd say down the road, most of the cars are going to be compact cars. Even the Cadillac's a compact car today. cars because what had happened was uh, something that seems to happen with people and organizations that they t tend to carry what is a, a success to an extreme and that's what the, the our competitors did they carried the idea of, of that they were building on to an extreme so I was able to talk about gas guzzling dinosaurs <laughs> And, 
And, and that was done in order to get somebody to listen to us in the marketplace. Because at that time point, uh, people in the marketplace didn't think anybody could say anything about cars, them anything except one of the big three. And gas guzzling dinosaur uh, did it. Now let me tell you a li little bit about the auto industry and, and then a uh, little bit about the country. Uh, because uh, my concerns today uh, basically are about our country. But in any event, uh, the auto industry in this country has been through about uh, four periods. The first period was the Henry Ford period, when he demonstrated you could produce a car that most people could afford to buy and own. And he got, it got to the point where he had 60% of the business. And then came along uh, the greater prosperity, because what he did economically is historic. If you want to read a book that'll tell you about our country in a way that no other book I've ever read tells about it, you ought to get a book entitled The Image of America, The Image of America by R.L. Bruckberger. R.L. Bruckberger was a Jesuit historian priest. He received a goal at uh, Notre Dame Cathedral when Paris was liberated during World War II. But he was so impressed with America's strength during World War II that he decided to come to this country to find out what made America different. And uh, he spent eight years here. As a result of that, he wrote this book, The Image of America. And he said the thing that makes America distinct and unique is that it has a religious foundation, that the Declaration of Independence is a religious document. They were endowed by our creator with unalienable rights. And then in that book, he traces the way in which that concept developed into what Ford was able to do economically because Ford was the first man that really established the economic strategy that lifted this country, most of the people in this country, out of poverty for the first time in history. Americans were the first people in a, as a nation to be lifted out of poverty almost as a nation. And that was because Ford uh, shared progress with workers and customers and uh, undertake, undertook to uh, spread the benefits. And that strategy and that philosophy was picked up by others. And so that helped create the prosperity in this country, made us the greatest creditor nation in history. And General Motors recognized this change more than at first. So General Motors began to emphasize style and size and power. And they were the first ones to do it. And that, entered, that created a second period in the auto industry. And before, by the time of World War II, Ford and Chrysler had to jump onto that bandwagon of style and size and power to compete. And of course, they ultimately carried that to excess right after the war uh, because, uh, as I say, they began to build these gas-guzzling dinosaurs at a time when the economics of car ownership became more important than which car you own. Because, you know, remember back in those days, a pedestrian was a man with two cars and a wife and teenage kids. But in any event, uh, the, the, the economics of owning more than one car became more important. So which car you were, owned wasn't as important as uh, take, being able to have the number of cars you needed. They didn't take advantage of their going to ex extreme. Now I didn't do that at uh, first. I was just a lucky guy that came along as a result of real genius in this industry who's never been adequately recognized for what he did. The man who developed and designed the uh, Rambler uh, concept was George Mason, my predecessor. And George Mason was the man that Walter Chrysler turned to to uh, produce the first Chryslers. And he was in charge of the first Chrysler production uh, in the history of the country. And there's a very interesting uh, story there because uh, Mason subsequently left Chrysler and became head of Kelvinator.
Calvinator was the first company that produced a, an electric refrigerator, replaced the old ice box. And Mason became head of the uh, Calvinator Corporation. And then Nash, who had, uh, had been heading General Motors, was let out of General Motors, and he established Nash Corporation. And uh, just ahead of World War II, during the Depression, old man Nash, who was a skinflint, <laughs> who you say pennies, he, I remember this story about his uh, t a messenger boy, messenger boy taking him to lunch up in Toronto when he visited up there, and at lunch he made the kids pay, kid pay for his own lunch at luncheon. Mm -hmm. But in any event, by the just ahead of World War II, he had, he had the money, but but he was old, too old to really pitch in and reinvigorate Nash Motors. So he went to Walter Chrysler and asked Walter Chrysler who he should get. And Walter Chrysler said, you ought to get that guy Mason. So he went to see if he could get Mason. And Mason said, I won't come unless we can combine the two companies. And so uh, Nash agreed to combine the two companies. And that's how Nash Kelvin came into being.